Welcome back to the Turn on the Music podcast. We are at episode 17. Today we're going to talk about a group that I found thanks to my good buddy Charlie. Um, we saw him many, many times at Stevens Talk House out in Amagansett. Uh, little Charlie and the Nightcats. And as always, to discuss our music is CJ. How are you today, sir? I'm doing good. How are you, Kyle? How are you doing, Kyle? <laughs> I forgot. I forgot to introduce forgot myself to, again. Yes. Oh man, uh, I'm good. It's been a, a crazy week, a crazy weekend, and then another crazy week. So, yeah, uh, yeah. It's been. It's been. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I'm recovering. I, yeah. No. I. I feel you. The past couple of days have been quite um, very eventful and not a good eventful, but mm. it worked. You know. Okay. Some 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 technical issues that thankfully did not affect the event that we were running. But well, that's good. You know, like I, I was able to do whatever I had to do to make it continue and work. And even they said on their side, it didn't look like anything was wrong. So good. That's the good part. And that's and, good. You know, my I, the IT team that I work with is really working hard to kind of figure out what the problem is. And you know, so. uh Otherwise, besides that, it was just it just made it very two long days. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So. Yeah, that was my week last week. Last week I was doing I was supporting um, an all week like event where they had multiple sessions in the morning. And then I'd go back to my other building to do my regular job. Um, and there was my coworkers last week on top of all that. So it was I felt like I was doing three jobs at the same time. It was just not fun. But other than that. We're here. Were you, are you, were you close? Like, did you have to travel far between the two buildings? Uh, it's about 15 minutes. Oh, okay. So it was not like you had to go like so. an app, but it's still, that's still pain. Get in the car. Yeah. Car. And, and because I was supporting this meeting, I wasn't able to get my normal morning stuff done. Right. So when I got back, I had to try and cram it all into the day. And then it was just not fun. So right. and then and I didn't get out to shoot any pictures last weekend, which made me grumpy. <laughs> but uh, this weekend is another weekend. So we'll, well do Hopefully weekend. you'll get some good ones this weekend. How's yeah. the weather by you? Because as we all know, like the heat is crazy across the board. It's getting hotter. Yeah. So we were, I mean, for the longest time, we were in the 70s and 80s. And we're, we were now, I think we hit 96 today. Oh, wow. Okay. So I yeah, got in the car. Up there. We, when I was driving home, it sat around 98, 99. Wow. Once, once like. I started driving and, and like kind of picked the temperature up from sitting in the parking lot. It was sitting around there and I know mm -hmm. that we're going to have a hot weekend. It's just, I, you know, everybody stay cool out there. Yeah. I know you're listening to this like a week later, but I know the heat's going to be around for a bit. So just mm -hmm. if, yeah, where, whoever's listening, if the heat's up, just be, do your yeah. best to stay cool and listen to some good music and listen to some good music. Yep. So speaking of what are you listening to? So this week, um, not it's really weird i didn't listen to a lot of music that over the time that uh from the last time we spoke but i did i i've been kind of on a daft punk uh kick i'm a big fan okay. of their random access uh, memory album which was the last one they did before they uh did their breakup video if you i don't know if you've ever saw that video but there's yeah. a whole video of them walking out into the distance and they break up because the group kind of went their own ways i don't i didn't go deep into why I don't know what the reason is I don't know if it was a mutual like we're ready to do our own thing or if it was le mm -hmm. legit something wrong but so is there I from what I remember it's the last album and I I, I like it there's a lot of cool stuff on it um nice. and so, I mean to be fair we I mean it's only been a few days since we recorded right you know and with your week you know I'm sure listening was not on no, top of your it list was tough but I I what I did come across and we can do this uh now or we can talk about what you listen to was on Monday, uh, Google how they do those little like, you know, celebration of whether it's an event or a person. Yeah, the or Google Doodle. The Google Doodle, yes, thank you. I couldn't remember the name. On Monday, they had Oscar, I believe it's pronounced Oscar Sala. And he apparently, or is, like the godfather of electronic music. You know, wow. and, and that to me, I thought was really crazy interesting. Now, I went on to Apple music to read his bio and it's a little bit long, mm -hmm. but I really would love to read it out out for a moment yeah, if I can skip it. through, I will, but I just, it's just, it's the time frame and the time period that just blows my mind. So uh, he's a German inventor slash composer uh, and he's best known for his role in developing the Troutonium, one of the earliest electronic in uh, instruments in contemporary of the French Ondes Mar 
Tenene and Russian theremin. A con- so it's a contemporary of the theremin, which is really funny because I think we spoke briefly. Yeah, and we and both said, said it's almost like it's there, right. Yeah. It's almost like it's so while the tritonium would eventually be viewed as a relic of electronic music's past, the instrument's tonal quality and expressive capabilities remain sadly unparalleled in the technology that followed, which I think is very interesting. So nearly 70 years after its creation, its legacy seems highly uncertain as Sala was the only one capable of playing it, which hmm. not he was born in Berlin in 1910. It was introduced to the Trantonium in 1929, that year, while studying under composed some composer. So d- he didn't invent the He Trantonium. didn't invent it. Okay. He just, he, it's one of the earliest, int- that's all, a, you know. Gotcha. But he studied under the uh, composer Paul Hindemith, mm-hmm. and he attended a demonstration of the instrument given by its inventor, Frederick Troutwine. Out, it's probably Trout. Troutvine, probably. Yeah, Troutvine, yes. The students soon began working alongside Troutvine, undergoing a crash course in electronics to develop the prototype into an acceptable model. So he helped in the development. And the new instrument was unveil, uh, unveiled. I started early. Unveiled. <laughs> unveiled. Uh, was previewed at a Chris City performance <laughs> in the midst trio pieces for three Troutonia at the Music Academy in Berlin. Right. And so if you read on a little bit and then uh, there was an or- then it gets into the war. So initial overwhelming success of the instrument is rather surprising, given the political environment of the time. Nazi Germany had begun the ethnic and cultural cleansing that would drive many artists, including him, the myth out of the country. Um, so n- not only did Salah's Trotonium escape being squelched, the government actually pre- provided funding for additional models, including the radio Trotonium showcased across German airwaves, which is interesting. And then following World War II, um, with Troutvine having all but relinquished control of the instrument, Sala developed the mixture Trotonium, a revised model, which gave the musician ability to produce musical undertones. Hmm. So the 1950s found Sala busy composing, producing, and works for television ads and feature films and performing with fellow Hindemith student Harold Gens- Gensmer on the new model. Um, in 1961, which is around the time Hitchcock's Birds was being filmed, mm-hmm. Hitchcock did not like the sound effects technicians, inf- uh, like what they developed for the film. So he hires Sala to um, redo the score, a non-musical construction wow. to the composer. Yeah, so like it was very interesting to to read all this. Uh, he lived until 2002, so he was you know almost wow. 100 years old. Born in wow. two, uh, 1910 to 2002, and as the century drew to a close, approaching 90th birthday, spent his days diligently practicing composing, experimenting on the mixture Trotonium from a studio near his home. A staggering 1600. 600 plus reels of tape are said to exist in the composer's personal vault in the late mm. 1990s. Um, uh, in the late 1990s, Germany's fax label issued two collections of solid performances, uh, My Fascinating Instrument 1995 and Subharmonic mich- Mixtures 1997. That was written, I, I believe Nathan Bush wrote this information. So credit to Nathan Bush who would, this is all on Apple Music, so this is all public facing stuff. So I, I'm just gonna play like a little bit of uh, one from, uh, it looks like a, a compilation album that he did called Five Short Pieces for Troutonium. And they're, sure. they're short, but uh, we're gonna play one from there. And it's very weird, but like mm-hmm. like my kind of weird. So, you know, for <laughs> me, I like it, but you know, other people may not, but uh, it's just, it's it's very interesting. So let me do. is called diagram 
It is number four on the album. Very sci-fi ish, which is why Very, I like it. Yeah. Which is I why mean, I like yeah. it. I love that that weirdness and almost awkwardness to it. And you know, we were looking at a quick YouTube video of the instrument, Kyle and I, just before we started recording. And like the theremin, you can't. It almost you don't know what you're looking at right. when you look at it. Like when you look at the right. instrument, it's like there's a little like bar that goes yeah, across, so. you know, and you have to kind of know. It's almost like a like a fretless instrument where you have to kind of know where you're putting your fingers. And, right. Um, but what's interesting is looking at the music. It's written like organ music would be written. There's three staves. Um, I only saw two keyboards. I don't know if there's a foot pedal or whatever. So I, I, there might be a third keyboard right. that I didn't see, but. Um, yeah, just really interesting. I, w- I want to look into it more and just see what it's all about because I've never heard of it before tonight. So. Yeah, I'm going to check it out myself. And if we get any more information, maybe uh, we can share a little bit more with it. But we'll probably share the YouTube video link just so you could check it out if you're interested in it. Yeah, I, I'll put the video yeah. that, that I found with the guy. You can actually see the music and him right. playing it because um, it's interesting. It is. And so. which is funny because Daft Punk, who is known for their type of electronic music on top of everything else that they do there. They were the composers of the music for the Tron legacy movie that came out in the two mm. thousands. And I know it wasn't like the hit of the Tron movies. Like a lot of people didn't like it, but I really enjoyed their music because it fit that sci-fi right. type thing. So I, when I was listening to this, I'm like, this would totally fit with their music. This would be amazing. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I wanted to share because it was I did not expect to like it and then when I listened to a couple of things I was like okay no I totally could like I said it's awkward it's weird but I, I like it mm-hmm. because of that reason so that's right. kind of what I've been listening to even with Daft Punk uh, how about yourself um, little Charlie and the Nightcats of course because I was getting ready for the episode <clears throat> um, and I'll tell you this I almost switched the episode because I've been listening to a lot of Robert Randolph and the Family Band since we spoke about it last week so we might need to do an episode of that soon. So, well, you know, we we do have potentially an interview next week. I know that right. there's a possibility right. that may happen. If not, then yep. we could talk about that. We might, we might yeah. throw that in there. Yeah, yeah, why not? So, I almost threw a curveball at you and did that tonight and just be like, "Hey, we're doing Reynolds tonight." So, well, I'll get be honest with you. I and I purposely did not listen to a, a lot of um to the group because tonight because i kind of wanted to approach it a little more new i know of them you've introduced mm-hmm. me to them a while ago yep. uh, i didn't really listen to them that much you know not because they're bad just wasn't you mm-hmm. know it wasn't my go-to i listened to them a little yeah. bit and i'm like you know what i'm gonna come into this not knowing much so okay. if you switched it on me it would have been just as good <laughs> <laughs> anybody else besides those two groups uh that's it really uh you know, like, like you it's been a crazy couple of days and i just haven't had a chance to do much of anything sure. so um, so yeah, well, why don't we get started with Please. little Charlie? And oh, Nikes. oh, you said yep. I forgot you mentioned. Oh, that's right. Yes, the, the Tower of Power episode. You were I asked you the a question. Tower of Power what episode. It? You did so. Back at the Tower of Power episode, you asked me a question. You said um, we were talking about um, Nickel Creek and Tower of Power, and how we view Nickel Creek as like friends, and yes. how do you view Tower of Power? Yes. Um, I, I thought while listening to the episode, I, I thought about it even more. And I think the age is the big reason that I don't see them as friends. I think because Nickel Creek is so close to our age, I don't like, you know, and I, I guess because I, I, I grew up listening, not really grew up, but when I was introduced to Tower of Power, I was in my 20s. And they were, let's see, I would have put them six in their 40s or 50s maybe 40s maybe probably because so yeah. they're about 20 years old yeah about 20 years older than i am i think so no, it'll be 30 so you know that, that that age gap i think is what you know stops me from seeing them as friends and you know and and i i guess i don't know if it's me but like even at work like there are people at work that like i'm older than them but i still see myself as like the younger guy that like like they're like they know more than I do and they have more you know it's like I, I don't see myself as I'm in my 40s yet I I think it's, so it's very interesting you said cuz I, I I think I get what you're saying in the sense that Tower Power is like your grandparents friends that you're sitting and watching play Yeah yeah, yeah or, or or my parents or your friends, parents really. friends or yeah yeah not to yeah, to, yeah. Uh, yeah no I get it but I think you're and not to go into this direction but 
I think that whole mentality that you have, I have a very similar mentality. Okay. And I think that's just because we both like to continuously learn mm. and not to sound like cliche and go into that whole right. route. Yeah, yeah, that's but true. But we're both always willing to learn something new. I, you yeah. ask me questions. I ask you questions. I probably ask you mm-hmm. more than you ask me. But, you know, but we're we're constantly back and forth just yep. trying to learn things. So I, I, I could see why you feel that way in your workplace. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. For, no, oh, it's cool. No, I know it's like because I, I was thinking about little Charlie too. Because you know, I, I had a feeling you were going to ask that question too. I think it's the same, you know, because they are, you know, like my mom's age, yeah. you know, and it's, you know, I don't see them as like friends. No, like no, I get people that. People I look up to that. No. You know, yeah, Nickel so. Creek, as we spoke, are closer to age or about our age, so right. I totally get that. But still, that whole idea that you could still see them as your parents friends or your grandparents friends right. were all right yeah i'm totally gonna sit down and listen to them play is that's a cool mm-hmm. feeling though because you, you're not gonna get that with yeah. every group so yep that's true please talk about little i can't little say it. Charlie little charlie and, and the nightcaps night cats. <laughs> night so we're gonna kind of get a two for one because uh little charlie started out as little charlie and the nightcats and charlie who was the guitarist um he left the group in 2008 and the vocalist and harmonica player, who we'll talk a lot about tonight, Rick Estrin, took the group over um, in 09 or so, 08 or 09, um, after Charlie took, um, he, he, he did a soft retirement is what he, what he called it. Um, and he would play with the group when they were back in town. They're based out of Sacramento. Um, so he'd come back for like the reunion concerts and that sort of thing and play with them, you know, little festivals near his house. Unfortunately, Charlie passed away in 2020 from a heart attack. Um, so it's just, you know, it's one of those things. He was only 66. I was going to say he's young. Um, when he passed. Yeah. He was young. Yeah, he was only 66. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but Rick has, has taken the reins of the group and he has, you know, you know, produced a lot of stuff and he's out winning awards. You know, he has become, you know, one of the great harmonica players of our age, really. And, and you'll hear that in some of the songs. And he's a great songwriter. And it's interesting the way he writes is he discusses topics that are um difficult to talk about in funny ways you know he talks about um you know getting divorced you know he wrote a song called my next (laughs) ex-wife you know so it's like every every you know woman he meets is his next ex-wife that's funny um you know and and just the, the humor he spins in his in his music He's able to talk about these difficult situations humorously and through music, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, you know, uh, a lot of it is based on on you know the hu- the male female relationship, and you know he he you know admits in there's a, an interview that I was reading about him today that I'll I'll link in the um, in the show notes, but you know he admits that he was you know kind of a womanizer when he was younger in his days, and he sees the error of his ways, and you know he's kind of cleaned up his act since then. But um, the group has gone over, you know, if there's, you know, it wasn't just Little Charlie that's changed. You know, they've, it's a smaller group. It's not a Tower of Power group. Right. It's, um, you know, vocals, guitar, um, bass at one point. I don't think they're using a bass player anymore. I think they're just keyboards right now and drums. Interesting. Um, yeah. And and the, the caliber of musicians that they've always had, they're always kind of like unknown people, but they're the caliber of musicians they've always had are amazing. So right now in the group, there's um, Kid Anderson, who's playing the guitar and doing backup vocals. Uh, he played with Charlie Musselwhite, who is, again, one of the greatest harmonica players around right now. Um, Lorenzo Farrell is playing the, the keyboards. He's played with people like Elvin Bishop, and uh, he played with Little Charlie back in the day for a while. Uh, Derek Martin on the drums, he played with Little Richard. You know, I mean, just some big names. Yeah, no, you know. Absolutely. So, and then Rick has just been, you know, playing with, you know, yeah, he's met so many people. He, he at 14, he, he heard the blues from his sister. And oh, he just kind of fell in love with the blues. Um, and just, you know, he's, he is so much about the tradition of the blues harp in the small band and what it means to the blues. Um, he's won awards 2000, actually 1994, he won, he won Song of the Year at the Blues Music Awards Song of the Year uh, for My Next Ex-Wife, which I'll play for you guys. Uh, then 2013 and 2020, he won um, the, the award for Best Harmonica Instrumentalist. So he is just, I mean, incredible. It's When I first saw him the first time at Stephen's Talkhouse, 
I had never thought I would use the word harmonica and virtuoso in the same <laughs> sentence before. But I watched him play uh, two harmonicas at the same time uh, and produce two different melodies at the same time. Okay. With that, I watched him shove a harmonica in his mouth and play it hands free. Wow. Um, I mean, unbelievable the stuff that this guy can pull hands free. Not even like that thing that they have. That not even the no. Like, like you put it. I don't know. What it's, like. uh, the, uh, the, it's a harmonica. Holder, what was it? <laughs> no, but he like literally puts the harmonica in his mouth, and as he plays it, you can see it kind of sticking in and out of his mouth. It moves as he's changing pitches. That's wow. Um, yeah, he's just unbelievable. And the sound he gets out of it, you know, it, there's a there's a, a DVD that he produced, and it's the, the the opening is this guy he's you know on the street playing harmonica, and he walks out. It just it sounds awful, you know. And you know, the, the, there there are people who can make sound out of a harmonica, and there's people who can make the harmonica sound good, you know. He's one of those guys that knows the technique and the the way to shape a harmonica sound. So let's let's start a little bit with um, with the fat and um, let's do a little um, let's do my next ex-wife because that's the one that he won song of the year for. Oh, nice. voice you know he's not i mean we, we were talking about ava cassie we right. talked with, with jess last week you know not your i mean not a traditional type of voice i mean it's right, and right. i guess that's maybe it's typical of the blues where you don't have that you know traditional voice it's that you know guy who's been through a lot of stuff and you know he's like he admitted he's been through a lot of weird stuff he's from right the chicago area so so are they considered are they considered a blues band they're a blues band, yeah. So, because I, you know, it's really funny. I, I brought up out of cur- I, you know, out of curiosity, I brought up Little Charlie and the Nightcats on Apple Music, mm-hmm. and you know how like, and I'm, I know the programs that you use. They, they say similar artists. So yeah. they now go by Rick Estrin, or they started to yes. Rick Estrin and the yes. Nightcats. Once, once Rick Estrin took over yeah. in 2009, they switched. But if you search for Little Charlie and the Nightcats, you get in most programs right. you get. Rick Estrin stuff, right? But the but and it's interesting because some of their songs are considered contemporary. Really? So my my the, the, that's why I say like, are they blues? And yes, they are blues. I'm I mm-hmm. wouldn't say that they aren't. But are we changing the genre of the music because people don't listen to blues as regularly as they make contemporary? Maybe. And and this is you know this is we had this discussion before I forget who we were talking about it oh it was Mingo Fish Trap right Mingo Fish Trap remember he had all the the different you know things and we we're I was thinking maybe he made that decision as he uploaded that music you know maybe he to get it into the you know eyes of more people um it's very possible I, I don't know like I I, I you know. it's a see okay so now that we're weekly and 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 mm-hmm. we can kind of like grab onto when listeners are saying something. If anybody has any type of information on this stuff, please share it with us. We're very interested. Yeah. I will do my own because this is more the business end of things. This is more of the building. Right. right. But uh, yeah, so uh, looking at some of their songs, uh, that the name of that song was My, my Next Ex My Next Ex Wife. And, th- and it looks like That's off of Night Vision. Night Vision. Mm-hmm. So that, I'm just curious to see what that's classified as. That's classified as blues in 1993. Yep. But if you go to anyway, continue on. I'm I'm just it was just sure. very interesting to no, s- I was I mean I'm just saying like it was very interesting to see that mm-hmm. genre change. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, then then I mean, God, these these guys. I mean, they're they're a group. You know, I, I talked about Tower of Power. They're they're Tower of Power is one of those groups that I can take just about anyone to, and they'll have a good time. Right. These guys are very similar. I mean, their stuff that's their, their studio stuff is. I don't want to say it's not as energetic as they are, you know, in person. And okay. their show, they usually do very intimate shows. I don't know if you've ever been to Steven's Talk House, but no. it's like 80 people, you know. Oh, it's wow. A very small, That's really intimate for a group. Yeah, like, yeah it's yeah. a very, I mean, very intimate. I mean, maybe even less than maybe 50 people. But I remember the first time I saw them, they were, um, they, they, they got to their intermission. They said, all right, it's intermission time. And they pulled their amplifiers off their cases. They had these these giant, you know, like cases that they had. It. And in there was their their merchandise. And they sat on stage. And you came up and you talked to them. And they'd autograph your stuff. And they just sit there and talk to you for twenty minutes. And then they go back and do the second half of the show. So you know, so you got to hang out with them. It was really kind of neat. So I so I, I I bring up this question then. So you mentioned that you think that their live stuff is better than their recorded stuff. Not saying their recorded stuff's mm-hmm. bad. No. Do you think they record well? Because I think they do record well, yeah. Because I, my grandfather, who used to sing, said there was a lot of opera singers back in the day that were phenomenal live. And I know we're talking opera mm-hmm. in this sense, but they're phenomenal live. But when they go to record, they just don't record well. Now, it could be just they're not comfortable in front of a mic or their voice just isn't picked up as well on the mic. Right. You know, and then vice versa. They had he had he knew of opera singers that recorded fantastically and then you mm-hmm. get them live and you're just kind of like where, where their vi- voice go. Like they were produced yeah. well or whatever. Um, would you see? I, I think their the- production value is better on their studio stuff. Okay. I find I, I've seen them many times and even listening to some of their live albums, I find Rick difficult to understand lyric wise okay. on the live stuff. But I don't have that problem with the studio stuff. Okay. But I think that there's there's a connection that they make with the audience. That's that what I was is asking, really too. A special. It's as that's that's where they they shine. I think is they really feed off the audience, and I think that that's what drives them. They they don't really like the studio stuff. I don't think. I think they really like just going and performing for people. That's awesome, though. I mean, like the yeah. fact that you're you're driven by the audience. So I'm, I'll let you continue on because you may touch base on this. If not, I'll ask the question. So no, ask your question. So the question would be. Now, this to me, my ex-wife, my next ex-wife is is humorous. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, so it's not it's not a hundred percent serious. Though there's probably, mm-hmm. to your point earlier, there's probably some seriousness to it because of his past. Do you does their music or their lyrics tend to lead more towards the humorous, or do you feel that that it's yeah. like a mixture of blues and humorous? I think it's more more humorous. Okay. Um, so like the, the next song I was going to play for you is a song called dump that chump. Um, and it's about, you know, dumping cause he, cause he wants to get with the girl. Yeah. He wants to, you know. <laughs> so here's, this is dump that chump. I mean, I, every time I listen to him, like his his harmonica playing is just so good. Like the sound that he gets out of that, yeah. Oh man! But I I see what you're saying. I feel like they're totally an audience group. Yeah, like it's great to listen to song, but I, in the back yep. of my head, I'm like, I want to be in the audience when people listen to this because you're not going to yeah. be in an audience with men and women, you know, right. a mixed group that mm-hmm. are going to listen to the song and they're sitting there and they're going to enjoy it and there's going to be some interaction in some way shape form which changes the song yep. or enhances yep. the song i should say so let me, just just because we, we've gone there let me play the live version of dump yeah that please that'd be awesome 
Um, in fact, let's go to the newer one. Let's go to the one that that uh, that they just released. Well, not that just released, but this is under Rick Astrid and the Nightcats. So they, they released a live album. Okay. What'd you say? Uh, you want to hear Dump That Chump? Yeah. So what you want to hear? So what you want to hear? Yeah, let's we'll keep it like that. So you see that there's there's a, a connection there. That and I, that's exactly what I pictured in my head when you played the yep. studio version is is the the call and response from the yep. audience and the fact that the audience gets into it that they're requesting them to do a certain thing yeah. or whatever. This is this is one of their their hits that they do almost every yeah. show. Yeah. Now, and it's just just going back to what we were talking with Jess last week. Uh, so that dump that chump came out in it was about twenty years ago maybe. Um, this album came out in 2014. Dump That Chump came out in... Let me find it. Oop. Oops. Wrong button. That's all right. <laughs> I didn't mind the uh, little clip. <laughs> uh, 89. So that's almost 40 years. Wow. But listen to Rick's voice. Right. It hasn't changed all that much. Now, granted, he's not doing anything crazy. But he's, he's got a blues voice. Like yes. it's not a yes. it's a singing voice, but it's not a singing mm-hmm. voice. There's that mixture right. of speaking. It's like a speaking song, a spoken yes. song, a spoken song. Better way to yeah. say it. Yeah, a spoken song, and I and but it fits. It works. It's a, yeah. It, it, it's great, but totally like you're a big live album person. I am. You are. I'm not. Not because I don't like live stuff. It's just mm-hmm. I tend to like the studio stuff because the way I listen to it. Right. But. I would totally listen to their live stuff more than their studio because yep. of the fact that you get that interaction. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yep, for sure. Yeah. Yep. So timeline wise, I know we did this with tower of power. Mm-hmm. What's what's what were you going to play one of their earlier songs when they first kind of yeah, like yeah. formed? <clears throat> let's go to the, let's go to that album. So, uh, 88 was their first, their first album. Mm-hmm. I was going to play a song called my last. I one more day, one last meal before they carried me away. He said, if we ain't got it, we'll go out and get it. Because you don't have to go till we get back with it. So I say, hmm, bring me two dinosaurs. Eggs over easy, fried in the bus. And not too greasy Mosquito deep Black eyed peas And a little small dish of butter Beat by beans Up on a zebra tooth A tiger stick And a whole hippopotamus Well, big night go Get my dinner go Get my dinner You ain't got it Go out and get it cause I ain't gone till you get back with it. Now me and cup. what's really interesting, I, I notice it more on this song than other ones, how much the bass really drives everything. And what's yes. interesting now is they don't have a bass player. Right. You know, it's all covered by the keyboard part. Which can still drive it, but it's a different yeah. feel. Yeah. It's a different feel. It's But it, what's cool about, like we talked about Tower Power a couple weeks ago, and we talked about how, you know, throughout the decades they their bass sound was always there meaning yeah. their their b-a-s-e sound their bass sound was always there mm-hmm. and the then core the, sound, yeah yeah the core sound thank you that's a better word and that 
allowed them to kind of add elements of the genre of the times there. Whereas mm-hmm. blues is blues mm-hmm. is blues. Right. So even now today, modern times blues still has that same blues feel to do it. Mm-hmm. Right. So, and yep. that's very cool. That's very cool about that. So that's 1988. Yep. Very cool. Uh, that's the yeah, first album. Yep. And then We're, we played one from 89. So the 93, let's see, what's a good one on here? Oh, from 93, we played My Next Ex-Wife. Right. So it was from the 90s. Um, then 2000, um, they did an album called That's Big. Um, and we're going to play the title track from that album called hey, That's Big. Uh, what's that, Rick? Hey, man, you see that one girl back there? Oh, what girl was that? Man, that, that big girl, that, that, that pretty girl. Back in the back, in the black dress. Oh man, I thought that was a solar eclipse. Oh come on, you know she looks good. Mm-mm, baby, I take the lady with the skinny. Stop me, baby, I like her just like that. Is that big? groove going the whole time it's 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 your traditional blues but it's got an edge to it so it's funny i was curious uh, yeah no it totally has an edge to it and it's uh, i'm going to put this link in um in a google doc for you but mm-hmm. i found an article about the history of blues okay and I, out of curiosity yeah, cur- my, my god curiosity well i just started off bad and it's just going in that direction <laughs> So ironically, the article is from February of 2022, so it's it's recent. So okay. I'm just going to skip down a little bit. The, the article is written by uh, uh, written by the Masterclass staff, so it's from Masterclass articles, um, and and it looks like it looks like Herbie Hancock teaches jazz is the art was is what the article is linked to. But going down the th- uh, hold on a second. So brief history of blues music. Much of the early blues tradition began in the Mississippi Delta, where it formerly mm-hmm. enslaved people and their descendants worked as sharecroppers. Blues has its origins in the late 1800s. Yep. That's how far back it goes, which is mm-hmm. amazing. Spiritual works, work songs, and field hollers of the time served as popular music with the community. Over the latter decades of the 19th century, these melodies inspired new genre onto itself. Blues was born in the 1910s. The blues began to enter popular music and in the first decade, uh, the first decade of the 20th century. And it was in, it said Memphis was the hub. Then juke joints helped popularize the genre. Uh, a blues lounge is event- eventually what it is. It says as the great migration of black Americans blossomed from the 1910s to the 1930s, juke joints became popular in cities like Chicago, Detroit, and Philadelphia, New York. And then and Rick women- is from Chicago. I'm sorry. Rick is from Chicago. Chicago. Okay, cool. So there's so like he, that. He had a connection to a lot of the harmonica players wow, okay. that were in the Chicago area. Okay, so there's the, and then, so women played an important role in the advancing of blues. And then, um, like they said, among the stars of the genre were vocalist Bessie Smith, deemed the Empress of Blues, Mammy Smith, and Mae Rainey, uh, which most of us should know those names because mm-hmm. they're big and with major hits with Louis Armstrong. And then they talk about prolific mid 20th century bluesmen like B.B. King, Bo Diddley. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it Lead Belly or Lead? It's Lead Belly, right? I thought it was Lead Belly. May, is Lead Belly? I could be I wrong. So. so maybe it's Lead Belly. It's Lead Belly. And John Lee Hooker drew, uh, drew large crowds throughout the United States and Europe. So the reason why I bring this up is that a lot of this led into what we have as rock and roll. 
mm. as country as the country music we know today, not the old the older stuff, right. but more of the country music that we know. So a lot of the music that a lot of people are into derived from this. Mm-hmm. genre of music and it's amazing yeah, you're like, how you're, you're you're johnny be good and the right that sort of stuff. right yeah. and that's what they you know you read further on they talk a little bit more about rhythm and blues and how it changed and how it mm-hmm. became rock and roll in that time period so it's just it's it's amazing how though the core of it is the same throughout the yeah. decades and doesn't mm-hmm. really falter and go okay i'm gonna put a little 80s in it i'm gonna put a little night no no it's just right. blues yep so and I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned you know that that you know the, the whole rock and roll connection because we we've been talking a lot about Rick, we really haven't talked about Charlie, who was, you know, he was the, really the focal point. And I think one of the big things when I saw him live, like there was a lot of focus on him as a guitarist. Okay. And on the studio stuff, you really don't see that. You really don't. I mean, and he's so good at what he does, he just knows how to accompany, how to kind of lay back and let Rick take the lead. Mm-hmm. And Rick, in in person, you know, in the in the in the concerts, would give him a chance to shine. Okay. So, uh, just to give you, I mean, just a, a little snippet of how good Charlie was on the guitar. Uh, this is a tune called Wildcatten. This is off of one of their live albums uh, called Captured. Johnny be good. Like, to me, that screams That's, Johnny be good. No, totally. Yeah. It's you know, it's it's amazing what? how uh, I could only imagine him improvising for like minutes upon minutes upon minutes mm-hmm. upon minutes in the show. Yeah, you know, and he goes to stop, and everybody's like, "No, no, no, keep going, keep going, <laughs> keep going, keep going. Like, You know. So yep. you saw little Charlie. Yes. At and Rick. Uh, Rick Estrin, Estrin, Estrin yeah. was in it with him. Yes, yes. And he just so they they they've been together since the seventies. They right. didn't put out an album until the eighties. Okay, but they've been together since the eighties up until two thousand six or eight or whatever it was when when Charlie left. Um, and then Rick just kind of took the band over and okay, did it because Rick was doing most of the writing, right? And Charlie was doing most of the guitar parts, you know, with Rick's writing. Okay, so Rick's you know songwriting is all over this, and Charlie was the kind of the, I don't want to say the musical genius behind it, but he was the guy that kind of put everything together. No, and and that, but it's really cool to hear them, you know, to see that it still kind of maintains that feel, even mm-hmm. though little Charlie's not there, no longer yeah. a group that he passed, like the, once they kind of move forward, you know, mm-hmm. after him. So that, that's very cool. But I do like their live stuff. I have to yeah. say, I, I think I would prefer listening to that. Mm-hmm. more than anything yeah so that was what that was your, 90s so that was 90s so we're in the yep. 90s yep and then shortly after that they, there was during that transition period they didn't put a lot out because charlie was moving out and rick was starting to take over um there was one um nine lives is the album that was kind of the transition album mm-hmm. probably their weakest album in my opinion okay um and then just to give you an example of this is from 2019. This is one of their more recent ones. This is, you know, a Rick Estrin um, thing. This is a song called Contemporary. They said the blues ain't going nowhere. Said I got to change my sound. My style's just too low down So I switched it up It really ain't no thing When you know how Hey, check me out I'm on contemporary now Wow That's a cool transition See, first 
you got to make it funky. You got to rock like rock should rock. You got to strain yourself and train yourself to think outside the box. Couple weeks, but now I finally got it down. Hey, check me out. I'm on contemporary. So, I know we're talking about how they don't really change their sound. They can change their sound, and no, no, yeah, absolutely. And you know. and it's really funny. I'm gonna correct myself. I totally misread how Apple set everything up. I read the album cover. The album title is Contemporary. I read it as the genre, and I clicked on it. I was like, oh, that makes more sense. It's still titled as blues. So the, all their albums are, are still blues, despite whatever the title of their song is. Yeah, so, I had a feeling because... No, that was my fault. Definitely my fault. Um, they use Alligator Records as their label, and they're a strict blues like record label. Um, that would make more sense. And it, yeah. like I said, it was really... When you said that, I was like, oh, maybe I read that wrong. So <laughs> I correct myself, and it's definitely all genre of blues. But... That song definitely um, completely changes. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the, so are, are, did you listen to this whole album? Are a lot of those songs like that where they kind of shift? Or they bring no, they're, the, most of them are, are in the blues. But this very shows, blues. yeah. This just shows the range. And, and I think a lot of that is their new members. Um, right. The, the old guys were, were very strict blues players. And, you know, just reading, just I mean, yes, there were... You know the, the guys that have been playing. You know they're playing with Willie, we Willie Walker and Elvin Bishop. You know big blues guys, but the drummer played with you know Little Richard. Not really the blues. You know, right. um, the Temptations. Um, the the he played with the Temptations as well. So there is a big range of stuff that's in their in their history, and that just though, enhances their live experience. Absolutely, because you you're I mean like like you said it it shows their ability to break out of the genre that the group is known for. And, you know, that's a business thing too. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm not saying blues is not there, but unless you listen to blues and unless you share that music out to the next person, mm -hmm. that blues is going to be lost. Right. So he's like, I can still do blues, but I can do this as well. Mm -hmm. And we can keep it going. And it goes back to our conversation or that we brought up a little bit and we may talk more in the future is about composition and classical music. Mm -hmm. Like, where do we stand? Is that going to phase out? Are we always going to have classical music? Right. Because with the pandemic, it changed a lot of things. It sure did. It changed a lot of things. And, you know, I, I there's um, and I forget his name and I can bring it up next time. But there is a uh, a group uh, or orchestral group with this conductor who does a lot of funny stuff. Um, it's a, it's mm -hmm. more humorous than it is anything else, but it's a combination of classical music, very similar to Victor Borga, right? Yes. Where he took this humor, he showed you classical music, but he said, hey, listen, I'm this talented, and this is what I can do to make you laugh. And I forget the name of the group, but the name of the orchestral group. And it was even to the point where they had like an opera singer come in and she went into the theme song of the original Star Trek. You know, with her voice. And yes. And I say to myself, I'm like, is this what we need to do? I think that's uh, it. Rainer a British Hirsch. Do yes. Yeah, yes. Rainer Hirsch. Yes. Is this what we need to do to keep people connected to classical music? You know, are we know. do you have to take a musician who has a unique unique take on the music? Or are they gonna play differently? Are they gonna add a beat behind it or whatever they're gonna do? Mm -hmm. Like He's still playing blues. Yeah. Except for that one song where he's like, hey, listen, we can do this. Just check it mm -hmm. out. You know? Yep. Yeah. Like that. that's what is always interesting to me. So pushing the blues out and showing the blues, because we'll never hear this really on mainstream radio. Right. This is us saying to you, hey, check this out. Listen to blues. And, it, and I'll tell you, one of the reasons I, I chose them as kind of the introduction to blues is because they have that humor to it. Right. You know, so when we were talking about acapella music and it was like we did the barbershop stuff where, right. you know, there's that humor that kind of draws people in. You know, I think like Tower of Power brings people in with their energy. Exactly. But like if you listen to the blues, like people, you know, I, I, 
you know, Nick, I was talking with Nick about the other day, you know, he hates the blues and I, I really wish I had played him some of little Charlie stuff just to see what he thought about it. But he's like, yeah, it's, you know, the same chord progression. It's the same, you know, stuff. Well, classical music's the same way. Like if you listen to a symphony, like there is a strict structure of like, you need to do this, then you need to do this, then you have to do this. And like, okay. You yeah. Know, and yeah, I always asked why and got in trouble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, you're absolutely right. And, and, um, but there's a reason why blues is blues. I mean, I read a little bit in the article. There, there is a, 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 a it's not a complete, it, it comes out of a, it, it's the, this is the, I think I may have mentioned this once before. I listen to, uh, um, uh, gospel music. Mm -hmm. I listen to gospel music. I think it's the choirs, the music, it's, absolutely amazing now i'm i will not say i'm a religious man it is mm -hmm. not my religion um but i respect the music i mean i think the music is fantastic and it comes out of some of the or mo a lot of the sadness mm -hmm. that yep. the this this the, they endured or endured like i said in the article like these mm -hmm. the, you know so I, I say to myself i go wow like you could, that's kind of what blues is Mm -hmm. Like exactly you're singing about your troubles, is. you're singing about the good times, you're singing yep. about the bad times, mm -hmm. and then like mostly about the bad, the bad mo times. mostly about the bad times, and then you yep. come out with this. But but see, here's the funny thing: like I know you're not a country music fan. Country music is the same way, right? You know, think you know, singing but, about your dog dying, your pickup truck dying. You know, right? It's all sad stuff. They just don't sing about their Maseratis dying. No. <laughs> <laughs> my woman don't go and leave me with my Love pickup my truck. You know, <laughs> there is um. Was it was it Home Free that did it? Probably. Oh, there was a there was a group there was a it was an acapella group, and um or maybe it's not it's a song about maybe you showed me this time it was a song about how the guy was like there's a Mercedes like the video is a Mercedes Benz pulling up into the driveway, he goes I don't even have enough money for my beer. I think it's, it's a Home Free thing. Is it a Home Free thing? Okay, I think I to, so. I have to look into it. See, this is my this is my old man head, just not remembering <laughs> things. So I like that song though. I like the the change up on it. It's very cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah I got to take a listen to that album. So it's all blues. I it's was wrong. Blues. No contemporary. The album's yeah. called Contemporary. <laughs> um, now they had. You said they have uh, new musicians. Was there a big change up? Was well, the whole group changed? You know, it's it's similar to you know like Tower of Power. Like they were, so they've had a lot of members. I won't say a lot. Not, I mean, compared to Tower of Power, not a lot, but you know maybe ten or fifteen different musicians from the eighties to now. Um, the guys that are there now have been there. I think the the, the shortest stint is six years. I think the other guys have been there close to you know fifteen twenty. Um, so you know it's 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 a good core group, and they're they're really sticking together. That's awesome, um, and they're still on tour. You know, they're you know they're. I was looking at their tour dates, like they're in Europe right now, like in Germany and Italy and stuff. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, how blues is so big overseas. Mm -hmm. Like there's uh, uh, over here, they have an appreciation for yes. guitar. Yes, and, that's what it is. And I'll, I'll tell you this: like when we brought up Hannah Wickland weeks ago, that she is big in in England because yeah. there's. That British rock stuff, right? You know? Right, right, right. Um, and I think it, it, isn't Orange the amplifier company from England? I believe you're asking the wrong person. Yeah, I know you're not a guitarist. You're, well, guitarist you're the one who's taking guitar lessons. Yeah, I know. How are the guitar lessons going? Uh, I actually stopped them. <laughs> I was gonna say, are you big in Europe yet? <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm not big in Europe yet. You know what? I it got to the point with these last couple of weeks with everything going on, I didn't touch the guitar for two weeks. And I'm like, listen, I need a break. Sure, I need to get everything under control. And then I'll get back into guitar. You know, it's not that I wasn't enjoying; it. I was really enjoying it. Right. But with everything going on, I just I needed so, something I had to give, and that's what you know. Because yeah. unfortunately, it's a half hour drive for me, a half hour lesson, half hour back. That's you know, it's almost two hours right. for a half hour lesson. So it's like ugh, I need more time during my weekend. Uh, it'll it'll it work out if it's still yeah. something you want to do. Yep. It'll come together. I all right. So I know like. We we've spoken for a good amount of time. I do want to ask your, uh, please share your experience seeing them live. 
The first time you saw them live. Mm-hmm. You saw them. Yep. So like I said, there was, it was the first time I saw them was um, at Stephen's talk house. They did uh, during the intermission. You know, they brought everyone up on stage. You could talk to them. And because I had just been introduced to the group from Charlie maybe three weeks ago, it was, it was when we worked at the hardware store, it was, we were always looking for conscious to go see. It was either conscious to go see or food to go eat. That's what we did. <laughs> uh, and usually it was food both music combined. Is good. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, so he introduced me to them. And he's like, yeah, I got to get your tickets. We're just going to go. I was like, all right, cool. You know, so I had gotten like two CDs from them. And the cool thing is when, when they were talking to us, like I went up to Rick and I was like, listen, I got these two albums. I want to buy like another one. Which one do I get? He goes, all right, well, what do you listen to? So I rattled off, oh, you like Stanley Clark, I like Tower of Power, I like this, this, that. He goes, all right, so you're into jazz. Get this one. And I got that one. So I, like, and he was just, just, and they're just so down to earth. Just, and like, everyone would just, you know, it's just easy to talk to. And like, it's, they're just regular people. And right. Was, and, and Victor Wooten, same way. You know, it's, this, it's the same, you know, I like people like that, that are, you know, yes, I'm amazing at what I do, but it's not a big deal. You know, and I right. think- you know, that's that to me, that's just it's it's something special, you know, and Victor talks a lot about it. You know, the way we teach music to our kids is so detrimental. You know, it's everything is about, well, you're not good enough to play with so and so. And Victor's all about, well, when you learn how to talk, did your parents say, well, you don't know your ABCs yet. I'm not talking to you. No, exactly. they would they would gather you up. You know, if you said a word the wrong way, they didn't correct you. They would say the word the same way, right? And right, encourage right. you to speak more, right? You know, because music to him and to me is a language, and I think these guys get that too. You know, it's all about, you know, getting people involved. You know, and I think that that's the other thing is when you have small groups like this, they understand that the way that they're going to be successful is to get a following, and if you are, you know, personable, you know, you're going to gain a following, and then you get that. You know, there are people out there like I am such a huge Victor Wooten fan. Like he can do no wrong in my book, you know, and you get people that follow you like that. You know, It doesn't matter how many people it is because those core people will push you and support you and do whatever you right. need. Um, right. And I think that they understood that. He's a humble. They're all humbled through what they yeah. do. Like they know they're good at what they do, but that's not what drives them forward. Right. And right. and that you know, and he was talking about it. It was an interview that I saw him do. He says, you know, as humble as I am, I have to be cocky, you know, because as a musician, like if you want me to play, like I got to be on my game. Right. If I'm second guessing myself, there's no way I can play. Right. I am the best person that I can be, and that's all I can be. Right. You know. And then you're but always striving make, to be better than that. Right. But just because I am the best person that I can be, it doesn't make me better than you. It doesn't make me better than the guy next mm-hmm. to me. We're all equal. Mm-hmm. And I was, uh, this is something I've been trying to explain to people. It's like, you know, directing this choir that I was starting to, to direct, you know, yes, I have all these years of experience, but at the same time, like, I'm going to make mistakes up here. Like, you're going to make mistakes up here. There, There's no difference between, the only difference that, that there is is I get to make decisions that you can't make. Right. But we're all in this together. Like, th- we're on a level playing field. Yeah, sure, I might have, you know, 30 years of piano experience and 20 years of conducting experience and know how to build a choral sound. And you don't know how to do that? Doesn't matter. Doesn't make me better than you. And you, and, know, you coming and, along for the ride. And that's, that's, I, I, that's part of the reason why we have been friends for so long because we, mm-hmm. that's how we've always been. We may, yep rip each other apart half the time mm-hmm. and you may look yeah. at our text messages and think that we are <laughs> the most we hate, hate each other <laughs> we hate each other but part of that is because of the fact that we we never think we're better than the other person right we know our skills we know what we're mm-hmm. good at and that's why i said earlier that we we know what questions to ask each other which is why we're always learning and i think yep. that plays to what you were saying in at your office is that you're constantly you don't you feel like the young person and i think part of that lies to the fact that you don't think you're better than anybody there right you're in this and and that's how i am at my office like the past two days were crazy and everybody was like oh you did amazing thank you and i'm like just doing my job like that's just what i'm doing like i don't see it as anything more as doing my job and i and i don't toot my own horn like Mm -hmm. i i know that i what i accomplished i know i did good 
but I look back and I'm like, well, I could have done that better. And I probably could have figured it out better out. And, and that's what, that's what you're saying. Like, and I get mm-hmm. that. I agree with you hundred percent. It's just, I, I don't care what degree you have. I don't yeah. care what background you have. I don't care. We're all on the same page. Mm-hmm. You're going to know more than me on something. I'm going to know more than yep. you on something. And that's, what's going to make us work together. And that's the backbone behind what we're doing here. Yes. You know, just because I know a lot about these random groups that nobody's right. ever heard of, it doesn't make me a better person than you. It doesn't nope. make me know more about music than you. It, it's just, I just want to say these people are awesome. Try listening to them. Yeah. And if you like them, cool. And if you don't, awesome. cool. And Whatever. if you have somebody you want to counter them with, awesome. Yep. Because that's yep. how we're going to learn and know about mm-hmm. new musicians yep. and be able to share them out. That's yep. awesome. Do you have more to share on little Charlie or Eric Estrin and the Nightcats? I'm gonna I'm gonna give you uh, I'm gonna play one more, please. Um, just because I I like it because this kind of goes back to the simplicity of the blues and one of the things that I've always admired about blues players and I think BB um, King probably did it better than anyone is he was he could take three notes and make it musical. Yes. Yes. You know, and it was just like, I mean, yeah, we can have the Tower of Powers that can do, you know, all these ridiculous harmonies and right. all these amazing rhythms, but just to keep it simple sometimes is, you know, just nice. Right. So this is... Um, Which is funny coming from you because half the time you I, don't like groups that do exactly. stuff simply. As, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's a different genre. It's a different way of playing. Like, I totally get that. Yep. I totally get yep. that. Um, so this is a, a, a piece uh, called Too Close Together, and this is Rick Estrin and a bass player. I think there might be drums that kind of fill in, but it's just very simple, just <laughs> simple. Yeah, 1900, uh, 84, I had two fine chicks living right on the dome. It was too close together. Too close together. Too close together, but <laughs> that was the best that I could do. I'm Simple. That's that's awesome. Harmonica, voice, and a bass. And to just to like, I know we're listening to it recorded, but to to probably have listened to that live mm. would have been amazing because it just kind of sounded like, all right, guys, we're gonna, all right, let's just have, let's just have some fun. Let's just yep. try this. Yep. You know, and it's really funny because all I can think about now in the back of my head is the Ellen John song. I guess that's why they call it the blues. <laughs> 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 oh my goodness that's too fun and then getting back to rick and his and his lyrics you know it's talking about you know he's living next to two chicks and he wants to date both of them and that's what the whole song's about right. you know which you know like like you said it's funny but there's mm-hmm. a little blues to it because he said because right. he can't figure out what right. to do <laughs> you know? yeah yeah and he approaches it in a humorous way and it's just it's great right because it's not a parody right it's not like Weird Al, Weird Al Yankovic being amazing what he does. He parodies yes. the songs and he does it fantastically. Mm-hmm. But they're not they're not parodies. They're they're right. legit songs written. They are yep, in a humorous way. It's just it's just yeah. it's real life situations with a humorous spin on it. But it works with blues. It, it works sure with jazz. Whenever yeah. you see comedians do it that play piano, they're not playing some pop song. They're playing mm-hmm. some just rhythm and blues scores in the background, and then they're mm-hmm. com- they're putting their com- comedy on top of that, yep. Like, which kind of goes to show you what you can do with the genre of music. Yep. Yep, for sure. That's very cool. Very cool. 
So anyway, I, I mean, I hope that this is, I hope it, it, it gives people a jumping off point for the blues because I think it's, it's one of those, um, it's one of those genres I think that is really important to the American culture. You know, it's that Americana because it, it started here. You know, I mean, that's 1800s. Read that article. Yep. Read the article. Mm-hmm. The link will be in the show notes. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's an important part of our history. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mean, and, and Rick is Rick talks about it in, in the in some of the bios. Now, there's going to be a, an article that I have. that He talks about it and a, even a video interview where he talks about the importance of the blues harp going back, you know, to those times and. And how he's trying to keep that tradition relevant and pass it on to the next, you know, he said, he said, I'm not trying to do anything special with this harmonica. I'm just trying to do what I do and pass on this information to the next group it's, of people. It's folk stories being passed yeah. on over and over and over again. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, that's why it's so important. It's, it's, it's like a book. The book holds a story. Mm-hmm. You're going to write a book about these folks' sto- stories. They're going to pass on. So you have this book to pass on. And then you have the yep. stories that you share with your friends and family. And those are going to pass mm-hmm. on. You don't want to lose that. Yep. And and I think... And, that, and the technique that he uses on his on his harmonica playing is... It's special. Right. You know, and, and it's it's been passed down from generation to generation. And he wants that tradition to keep going. And, and as someone who sees... Like we were talking, like classical music might be going away. Like I don't want to see this tradition to stop. Right, right. Like you know, the I idea want... of going to a symphony and and or going to a concert hall and listening to a symphony in in the way it was written, and I mm-hmm. get the variations that we get, but like, are we going to lose that? And and I love the fact that he's mm-hmm. trying to push up. It's just I'm sure that's the same thing that Victor Wooten's doing. Yep. It's just in a different way, you know. Yep. That's awesome. That's very cool. Now I want to read. Now it's still sitting on my desk because I have to clean up my office. I want to get into the spirit of music, the mm. second book from Victor Wooten. Yeah. And when does his album come out next month? Uh, sometime in August. I don't sometime I think there's an August. exact date. Okay. But once I find the exact date, I'll let you know. It's a good thing we have a plan out for our episodes, mm-hmm. but we can also change it up once that album comes out. That's right. Thank you so much for sharing. That was like oh, my le- learning a little bit about about them and, and 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 their progress and stuff. Sir, would you like to read Sir. the the closing? Well, before we do that, um, please. I want to say thank you to uh, a listener that has been yeah, um, absolutely. Nick Cruzman, who has been you know, uh, who was on our show back in episode eight, um, has been following along, and he said, "Hey." You gave Jimmy a shout out. Why don't you give me a shout out? And I said, well, I didn't realize you were listening. <laughs> Still, <laughs> I thought you just listened to your episode. Oh, that's right. Because we did not give him that shout out on no, that day. We didn't. That, no, please. That's awesome. So, I, yeah. So he's been he's been following along and uh, giving me, t- telling me that I don't talk very well. And, you know, so. <laughs> so thank so, you, Nick, wait, for wait, letting me know that I can't talk. Wait, if you don't speak very well, what about me? <laughs> Yeah, he only criticized me, I think, because he doesn't know you that well. That's okay. He can criticize me. Uh, (laughs) Has Charlotte said anything new? Because I appreciate her criticism. Um, Nothing new, which means I guess I got all the notes right for the last two episodes. That's awesome. Yes. Uh, (laughs) Still criticize him, Charlotte, please. It just (laughs) adds to the flavor. (laughs) Good shout out. Thank you, Nick, yep. for but making she, me she feel She was good. excited. She got she got two shout outs during the Tower of Power episodes. So she was excited That's about awesome. that. That's so, great. Yeah. She's going to continuously get shout outs and she's going to give you a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I appreciate the fact that Nick said that you don't speak well. And what I know, yeah. I don't. So that makes it even better. <laughs> awesome. <sighs> Thank you, Nick. Um, <laughs> would you like to read the closing? Uh, no, because I don't have it up. I had it up last week, though. Actually, I might still have it up from last week. Do you want to read it? Let's see. I mean, so far, we the only Nick read it and Jess read it. Uh, Nick didn't read it. Nick didn't read it? We didn't have him read it? No, he uh, he did his own little thing at the end. Oh, that's it. right. He did. He did. That's right. And it was good. It was, that only, was a good. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And um, I do have it if you want me to do it. Yeah. So if you listen to if you listen to episode 16, we had Jess read it. Um, yes. 
I, I don't know if I want Kyle to read it just yet now at this point. We've been on a roll of we have just been. back and forth. I've only done it once, yeah. well, twice now, yeah. I think. So, uh, the first one and the one where you, you were vocally not well. Yeah. You know what? Read it. Read it. You just rocked out little yeah. Charlie Nycotts and Eric. Unless you don't want to. <laughs> I, I never want to, but I'll do All it. All right, anyway. fine. I'll do it then. <laughs> All right. I'll good. read it. <laughs> Sir, thank you. This was a good episode again. Um, it was nice to to learn about them a little bit more. And like I said, I knew of them, but not as much as I do now. And, and, and I'm even more intrigued by some of their live albums. So, Kyle, thank you again. There are, there are two albums. I'm, just, Please. I, 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 but, 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 but I'm going to keep talking. Um, I always try to let, do this at the end of the episodes just to give you kind of a, a place to start. Um, so I would start one of two places. Um, the newest live album that they did was called You Asked For It Live. Very good album. The one that really hooked me was, um, I always get the name wrong, so let me look it up. Um, Disturbing the Peace. Cool. From 1988. I'm sure you'll- That's the one that has um, my, my, uh, the last meal that I played. Bunch of really great songs on that one, so. And I, I probably, say, and there's also Captured Live, which is a good one, too. Awesome. Awesome. Drop those into the show notes, I guess, like where to we'll start. Do. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. I love that idea. Yeah. Like just giving them even wherever the albums may be. Cool. Mm-hmm. Again, that was Kyle speaking because, you know, he forgot to introduce himself <laughs> earlier. And so we're just going to say one more time. That was Kyle speaking. Thank you again, Kyle, as he waves to me. Yes, and none of you can see. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Turn On The Music, the podcast. We hope that you join us next week. Follow us on Twitter at Turn On The Music and on Instagram at Turn On The Music Podcast. If you like what you heard, share it with a friend. And if you really, really want to help us promote the show, head over to Apple Podcasts or the podcast service of your choice and give us a five-star rating. Remember, always share the music. And let's listen to Run Me Down uh, off of Disturbing the Peace. You got to run me down. You got to run me down. If you want to contact me, you have to run me down. I got work to do. I'm the busiest man in town. If you want to contact me, you got to run me down. Just because, hey, when I get my dough, I'm just a little bit tough to find. And if you want to pay my bills, you got to run me down. Hey.